Top 10 Jesus cannot be God, that God cannot be born. God did not come into existence. He's always existed, he did not come into existence from non-existence. He was not born, he was not created, and he's always been even before there was even a thing called time. As we all know, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was in the womb for nine months, and he was born. So, that by its very nature shows that he does not have the same qualities and characteristics that God has. God cannot be born, and Jesus was born, so those two people cannot be the same. That's number 10. So God had no beginning. Jesus, peace be upon him, had a beginning, okay. Imam Ghazali explains beautifully the concept of God in his book, The Revival of the Religious Sciences Volume 1 page 130, God has got no length and breadth as these are attributes of a body which is an originated thing. Its creator existed from before it. So how would he enter in a body, as he existed by himself before all designed things and there was nobody along with him? He is an all-knowing, almighty, willing creator. These attributes are impossible for a body. God exists by himself without the substances of a body. He is not like any worldly thing, instead, he is ever-living, everlasting, and nothing is like him. Where is the similarity of the creator with the created, the fashioner with the fashioned? Hence it is impossible that anything can ever resemble him. Number 9, let's get to it. Number 9 would be that there are no explicit verses in any scriptural texts, especially the Bibles that say so. Now God, when he speaks of things, when he talks of his characteristics and who he is, he is very, very explicit. For instance, in the book of Isaiah 46 9, God says that I am God and there is nothing else, I am God, and there is none like me. Also, in the verses that Jesus quotes, he said here O Israel, the one quoted in the Jewish synagogues every time they have a service the Lord our God is but one. God and there is none else, and we all know the verses. You can go through the Old Testament, and read about God's characteristics when he describes himself. It is always explicit. There are some verses in the New Testament that can be implicitly interpreted as Jesus having not claimed himself having had the divinity. Still, if that was such a deep characteristic, if it was such a big deal that Jesus was God, if this was the way to salvation that he was God in the flesh, come to sacrifice himself for the sins of humanity, then that is something God would have been explicit about because it is an issue of salvation. God does not beat around the bush about these types of problems. When it comes to who he is, he is unequivocal with the children of Israel. I am God. There is none like me, do not worship anything else, period. When Jesus came and quoted the very same verses, so if it would have been an issue of salvation that he was God, he would have very clearly stated I am God, I am God. He would not have told them, I, E, the Jews, when they said to Jesus, do you call yourself God? He said, you say that I am God. He would have clearly stated, yes, I am God, and I'm here to save you from your sins. We look at these verses. If you look at them from the aspect that you've never heard of the Trinity, if you've never heard that Jesus come in the form of a man, then these verses would not say that to you. These verses would not say anything other than what they are meant to say. It will display in the beginning was the Word, and the Word becomes flesh we Muslims also believe that Jesus was. God's Word made manifest. That's what He is. He was God's spoken word on this earth during that period. Muslims accept the verse I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except by me, we believe that verse when interpreted in light of everything else that God has said, it always makes sense. The Quran says that about Prophet Muhammad those very same words. Each prophet in his time was the way that led the way to God. Abraham was the way in his time and so on. 
But if you want to take those verses out of context and try to prove a point with them, I could say that God doesn't exist, and I can go and try to use some verses from the Bible, put them together, and say, God does not exist. You know what I'm saying, to me, you can make the Bible say anything you want to. You can make the Quran say anything you want to if you pick and choose verses and interpret them in light of preconceived emotions. But if you look at these verses analytically along with the explicit verses when God describes his nature, in the explicit verses when Jesus describes his nature then it will come very, very clear that he was a human being. So if a theologian wants to prove a point, he'll take these and try to prove it, but all the while, there is no clear-cut statement when Jesus, peace be upon him, ever said, I am your creator, worship me. He never said that. There is not a verse in the Bible where that is expressly stated. And neither is the word, Trinity, in any Bible. Eight is that no one and the Bible says that no one has ever seen God at any time. This is very clear, John 1.18 says, no man has seen God at any time. In 1 John, no man has seen God at any time, even Jesus' statement in John 5 and 37 Jesus says, and the Father, himself which has sent me, has borne witness of me and you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face at any time and Jesus was standing right there amongst them. So had he been God, why would he say that he has never seen God at any time? You understand this is what I'm talking about, and IT is clear cut, you have never seen and heard God. If he'd been God, he would have said, and you're looking at God right now. You want to see God, look at me, and you've seen him but he never said that. There are some verses in the Bible someone can read and say anyone who's seen Jesus had seen the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father or the Father, and I are one, you know those type of verses, but if you read the context of the verses, the context of four or five different verses, you will see that he was speaking of being one in purpose. Even the one where he says that. The Father and I are one, he was speaking about just as no one can pluck the children of God out of God's hand, no one can pluck them out of my hand cause I and the Father are one, meaning that we are one in purpose, who have the same. Exact Mission I am coming as God's messenger, a message bearer to humanity. We are the same in what we want of you. I am God's representative, and anything that he wants is my will also. So if you understand it in that light explicitly, then you know that Jesus said that no man had seen God at any time this is also in the Quran. In the Quran, Moses asked God to show himself, and God said look at the mountain, if the mountain can bear my light, then you can see me we know that when God showed himself to the mountain, it crumbled into pieces and then Moses said basically, I'm sorry, that I don't want to see you. We cannot stand to see God, God is not someone who can come in the form of a human being, and you cannot contain God's essence inside a physical form. God is beyond anything to put inside of a physical form. He is too great. You must understand that he is too great to be put in any form, in any perimeters, in any dimensions, in any box. You can't put God inside a box. Number 7 This concept was not told by Jesus or his disciples, nor was it a belief then by his followers, that is the early followers of Christianity as we see when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, we see that the early Christians were part of Judaism. If you read the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ had departed from this earth, the disciples still attended the synagogue. They still daily went to Jerusalem's temple and worshipped as the Jews worshipped because this is what Jesus Christ taught. He brought the renewal of the laws of Moses, so if the disciples were running around teaching people that Jesus was God, they were then banished out of the temple the day they walked in, or they would have their church Jesus went to the temple himself. He did not build his church anywhere and never said, worship me. He went to the temple and worshipped God the same way that Moses worshipped God, the same way that Abraham worshipped God, the same way that David worshipped God, the same way that Zacharias worshipped God. You know he did the same thing. His disciples followed him, 
And if you look at the 1st, 2nd century Christians, they did the same thing. The people of Qumran, the first assembly who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, were also a part of him. They considered themselves Jews who followed Jesus as their prophet. So we see that nothing had changed. This whole concept of Trinity did not come about until the first century of the Church, and it was not formulated as a doctrine that must be believed in until 325 a. d. at the Council of Nicene. When all of the bishops and their scholars of Christianity were started, Christianity after Paul came and said, OK, this is a doctrine we must believe in, and the first person to expound his doctrine was Paul. Paul never saw Jesus Christ himself, never walked with him, never talked to him, never saw him, never ate with him, never learned from him. He formulated a vision, that he says he had while he was on his road to Damascus to persecute Christians. So the first person to ever come up with these titles of Trinity and the Godship of Jesus Christ or Only Begotten Son, all of these things came with Paul, the self-appointed Apostle. Is the word Trinity ever mentioned in the Bible? It does not exist, and there's only one verse that barely mentions it is, 1 John 5 and 2 that there are three that bear record on earth, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three that bear record in heaven are the blood and water if you go and research that verse, almost all biblical scholars had removed that verse from the Bible because it is not a verse that was ever in the Bible. If you go to the revised standard version of the Bible and the new standard version, all these have removed that verse because it is explicitly not a part of the Bible. It is not found in any manuscript before 1200. God is one not three in one, worship him alone. Number six reason is a massive and significant one. Jesus ate, slept, and prayed. He ate, slept, and prayed. We all know God, by his very nature, is self-sufficient. He does not need anything to continue his existence. God does not need to eat, God does not need to sleep, and God does not need to pray. God does not require anything because if he required something, then he would not be God. If he needed something other than himself to exist, that would not make him God. That would take away his Godship, and we know that Jesus Christ was born, we see that he ate, we know that he slept, and we know that he prayed. Had he not eaten, slept, or drank any water, he would have died. Therefore, he was not self-sufficient. He needed something to continue his existence. Therefore, by his nature of not being self-sufficient and God being self-sufficient, those two things cannot mix. You cannot be self-sufficient and not self-sufficient all at the same time. And Jesus prayed, he required prayer, any time he had an issue, he would pray. He would tell the disciples I needed to go and pray. Where did he pray? He would go to the temple to go and pray. Placing his face on the ground, his very nature shows that he required something greater than himself because that is in the essence of prayer showing that you need someone more significant than you. Even people who worship idols believe that the idol is more important than them. Therefore they pray to it. So, if Jesus was God, why was he in need of prayer? He would have been telling people to pray to him, you need to pray to me. And he would have told them I don't need to pray to anyone. So, therefore, by the very nature of his necessity of him requiring something else, he cannot be God. Number 5, number 5 reason is that Jesus claimed that God's knowledge was more significant than his. When he was asked about the day of judgment hour, he said, Of that day knoweth no man, nor the angels of the heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father has knowledge of that hour. So, if he had been God, he would have known that. How could God, if the Trinity was indeed faithful then God was God, and Jesus was God, and the Holy Spirit was God, they all the same person that means how does one not know the same information that the other one knows if they're the same person. If God knows the hour, Jesus should know the hour, the Holy Spirit should know the hour. 
they should have all known that even Jesus said in another verse in John 14:20, he said, the father is greater than I, he admitted the father is more significant than him. So if they are equals, how can the one be greater than the other? If they had both been God, how can one be greater than the other? Showing that Jesus did not have the same knowledge that God has, how could he be God you see, these are very explicit statements, and if you weigh all of these statements against the ambiguous ones which ones are you going to weigh out more? Point blank detailed, and to the point, or those that can be interpreted this way to anyone who wants to give them an interpretation. These cannot be interpreted any other way than Jesus was not God. He was something less than God. Dot you don't have to be a doctor, or theologian, a scientist, a layman to understand this. Right before we get to number 4, we're just speaking about how everyone should be able to understand this. This concept of Trinity cannot be explained to a child. Let's take that 6 or 7 year old child and explain to him the Trinity. He would never grasp that concept, and God's way of life is something for everyone. It should be able to be explained to someone who is unlearned, it should be explained to someone who has a Ph. D, and rocket science, it should be able to be presented to a child, it should be able to be explained to a deaf person. But you cannot explain this concept of Trinity. There was a British man and it was one of the most exciting parables that I have ever read or come across. It was a British professor named Richard Pastons he was debating this concept of Trinity with a friend of his who was a Trinitarian. As they were discussing this issue, a carriage came along. It had three people it, the Trinitarian said look, look, there is an excellent example of the Trinity. One carriage, three people in it. The professor said, you want to show me the Trinity, then show me one person in three carriages, one who is the same person in three carriages, then you would have explained to me the Trinity, and then I'll believe the Trinity. So then, I thought that was very interesting to me because it's a concept you can't explain. It's unexplainable, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1 or 1 by 1 by 1 equals 1 and all these things are not understandable by anybody even if you have some rocket science and pH. D then you'll be a little bit confused, and even in the Bible, God says he's not the author of confusion. So if that is confusing, then it means someone else must have authored this whole idea. You tell that same child that there is a creator who created you. Worship him alone, he's the only one. He's the only one who can get official worship. One, that's it, they can understand that that child, right there, can understand it, one God. Not like a party, you split him up into slices no, he's not like a party. Number four is that Jesus explicitly states that he is not God. For instance, in John 17 3, he says, this is life eternal. This is the way to eternal life that they may know you the original God or true God and Jesus Christ who you have sent us your messenger. He said this is in a nutshell to who I have come to teach. That they may know you the only true God of Jesus Christ whom you have sent and to anyone who is a Muslim, that statement makes very, very, very good sense because it is either a part of our faith where you will say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah was Isa Rasulullah which means there is no God but one God, Muhammad is his messenger, and Jesus is his messenger which means they are the ones which were sent, and that's defended our faith to believe in the one true God and Jesus Christ who was sent. It's straightforward, very explicit. And also, he said in the Bible to Mary Magdalene when he ascended to God, Jesus saith to them I ascend unto my Father and your Father, my God and your God he very clearly equated her God and his God as being the oneness in God. He didn't say I'm going to ascend to myself, and unto your God and me. You know, this doesn't make any sense. If somebody would have said that, he would have been most foolish if he said I'm going to ascend unto myself. Your God is me, and I'm going unto myself, you know all these things are very clearly stated one true God, and I'm ascending to my God and your God, point blank. These things cannot be any more simple. 
Number 4, you need to put your emotions to the side as I said, we're not trying to upset anybody, we're trying to relay the truth, and you got to be honest with yourself. This is something that just makes sense watch out for the person who tries to pull the wool over your eyes and tries to tell you otherwise, alright? They will try to explain something that you see very clearly is not what it is, you know, God is one, is something that's embedded inside of you already, and we're going to continue, proving this, and remember, Jesus is close to our hearts and that's why we're clearing his name here. He was a mighty messenger. We are coming down to the top 3 now. We came from 10, we're down to 3. This is almost over, see for yourselves. Colon number 3 is that even when you get to the title Son of God, either when you get the title Only Begotten Son of God, this is not an exclusive part of Jesus Christ as many people think. There are many, 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 many instances where the word Son of God is used and if anyone would study Jesus' culture, especially ancient Jewish culture not orthodox Jewish culture to be called a Son of God is a title of esteem and a type of prestige and honor even being called Lord. Someone would come to the rabbi and refer to him as my Lord. This is something that is known by Western and Eastern Europeans also, they refer to people as Lords, so this title is not exclusive. And Jacob and Solomon in Exodus are called sons of God. Ephraim and Jeremiah and Adam are called sons of God in the New Testament. Ordinary people are called sons of God in the New and Old Testaments. So these are not something that's an exclusive title, a son of God. I discussed this with a pastor. He said yes, but Jesus was the only begotten son of God, and I said okay, what gives him that exclusive title? What is the characteristic that shows him that complete title? He told the New Testament said that I said yes, but there must have been a reason why he has this full title. He said because he was born miraculously without a father and in Jewish culture, your lineage was from your father's side, you know, you'd be the son of your father, and that's how your family was traced, not through the mother. So, therefore, it says his lineage stopped there, he had no father, so, therefore, God must be his father. I said, okay, that makes sense to an average human being I said, but if that is the characteristic for his exclusive sonship that he had no father, then what about Adam and Eve? They had no father and no mother, they were fashioned as God says by his own hands out of the earth. And he just made them out of nothing, nothing existed out of creation. And he created Adam, and he made Eve. So if anyone should have the exclusive title to be the only begotten son of God, it should have been Adam. Because not only did he not have a father, he was the first creation. Therefore, why does he not have that title? Why also does not? Does Eve have the title of being the first daughter of God? Why are we not worshipping Jesus as the exclusive son of God? He had no answer. That is why God decided to send Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a must to all the world. Because we even know that Jesus was not sent to the world as a whole, he was sent to the Jews even though in his statements in the Bible he said that I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He was not a prophet for everyone, he was a prophet exclusively for their people as was every prophet before him. Every nation received a messenger, children of Israel received more messengers than anyone, but finally, God decided to send one for the whole of humanity, and that was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, whom they said that Jesus had spoken of him. We're not taking anything away from Jesus. Jesus was one of the patriarch messengers of Islam. There are five, and he is one of them that was sent. Muhammad had said that when it comes to someone who is like me, Jesus is just like me, and not only in his message but in a time of span, that we were away from each other it's Jesus. He is the closest prophet to me, in the message and in time of 600 years. Is there a chapter in the Quran we know of after Jesus mother, is your question? Colon yes, chapter 19 in the Quran Surah Maryam, which means the chapter of Mary. It is an entire chapter that is named after the mother of Jesus Christ Mary. Muslims believe that Mary was the most incredible woman and the highest woman ever of her time, as God chose her to bear a prophet. 
If anyone wants to read the true story of Jesus and his mother, you know, the story of Jesus' birth, go to chapter 19 of the Quran. It will make you cry cause it made me cry the first time I read it. It is in the most beautiful tone of language. And a more soft spoken and more accurate manner than you could have read in the Bible. That was number two. We see that dogs have puppies, cats have kittens, what do gods have? Baby gods? So we need to just think about this. Look if you say that I have a son, and he's a goldfish, does it make sense, and I have a son in me? In other words, I had myself it doesn't make sense. You can't clone God, no it doesn't make sense it makes no sense whatsoever. If the son grows up, he's going to have the father's attributes. So if the baby son can die, then the father naturally can die. And these are qualities we can't give to the creator. He doesn't die, he can't. He doesn't have a beginning, so I wanted to clump these few things out, let's go to the following reason. The top 10 reasons why Jesus, peace be upon him, cannot be the creator of the heavens and earth. Number 2. In Malachi, God himself, God cannot change this is an explicit statement directly attributed to God, God says I do not change. He stated that I do not alter my nature, I don't be happy one day, sad the other day, angry the next day. His nature does not change. Therefore God cannot be subjected to the same laws which he created. Because God created time, therefore, he cannot be subjected to time. He does not pass through time, he does not get old, doesn't get tired, he doesn't get sleepy. He doesn't go through the same stages of time that we go through. He created time therefore, he doesn't need it. He created the sun, therefore, he doesn't need its warmth. He doesn't get tired, he doesn't get cold these things do not happen to God. God cannot put himself into a human body, come to this earth and be subjected to time, be subjected to dishonor, be subjected to tiredness, be subjected to death, and be even hurt these things which God cannot by his very nature be. Some people say you know that God can do anything and that is not a correct statement because God can do anything prominent to his character. First, God cannot get help, God cannot go to heaven, God cannot die, God was never born and God didn't eat. There are certain things that he cannot do because it will be against his nature. It would be against his Godship it will make him less than God, so God can do anything except that which will cause him less than God. And that's why he has attributes. Any attributes which can be attributed to human beings is not something that can be attributed to God. But things that can be attributed to God cannot be attributed to us, or anything that can be attributed to us cannot be attributed to God because it would make him less than God. This is an essential point because people will try to refute you and say that God can do anything, but we want to make this clear, that the creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty. He doesn't do things that are not godly for instance if he had no beginning, he doesn't die now, so if he's the justest, he's not going to do injustice. His attributes are being self-sufficient, so that means he's not going to be needy of somebody. For instance, now, another example, God is truthful. He's not going to lie, and I want people to understand this part. He cannot murder someone unjustly, God can't steal from someone. All of these things we do make us less than perfect, God cannot do wrong because he is perfect. Anything that would subtract from his nature as being God he cannot do. If something makes him less than God, he cannot do it. Not only would he not do it, but he cannot do it because that is his nature. Nature that is not godlike cannot exist in God he does not change. And that is another reason why the Trinity cannot be, God cannot be one, 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 forever and ever and then decide I'm going to be three today, three in one and one in three. He does not change. In the middle of the whole scenario, God decides you know what, I'm going to change the method of salvation he's got to be consistent, God is very consistent. He is a consistent God, he does not change. Therefore, we know for sure he's not going to change his method of salvation. The process of salvation has always been the same, 
in that we have to go to God directly by showing that we are worthy of forgiveness by repenting and asking for forgiveness, and therefore, He forgives us and then does good deeds. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it's always going to be, nothing is going to change in the middle, in the end, it's never going to change. This is going to be the method of salvation. So that was number two. Before we go to the number one reason of faith because there are probably some people that's been following the show for a while and now we want to emphasize that there is a negation and affirmation if they make a negation here that in Allah we're negating any other deity that nothing in this creation can be the creator, that there is only one actual creator, so let's talk about this a little bit. So now some people may say where do I go from here? We want to give them something else to come to. Some people may think that we were just bashing one way, which is not what we are trying to do. We are trying to show the true essence of God and Jesus Christ. We are sitting here in defense of Jesus. This is the whole purpose of me coming up with this subject was that I love Jesus very much and want to defend his nature because he had a Lord he worshipped, which we will see in just a moment. The negation and affirmation are what we've been talking about. The first part of La Ilaha which means that there's no other God, that is what we are trying to say, that there is nothing under the heavens and the earth, there is no angels, no man, no beast, no idols that have the right to be worshipped, the second part Ilalu except the one true God, whose name is Allah and that is the creator of everything. That is the affirmation for someone to come to Islam. And that's what we're trying to get, that there's one God who is the creator of everything, and he's the only one who deserves to be worshipped. He created you without asking anyone's permission, he did not have to ask your father or mother to make you, he did not have to ask Jesus to make you, he did not have to tell Moses to make you. Therefore, you have to ask no one to worship him. You go to him alone, by yourself, worship him as one as the creator, and then when you realize that there's one God, you have to figure out his message. What does he want from me, and that's where God's messengers come in. For humanity now, that messenger would be Muhammad, who was someone that Jesus foretold of, Jesus very clearly in the New Testament predicted Muhammad as the last and final messenger. He's the mercy unto humanity, and he's the one who told us how we should live, and it is nothing new. Everyone thinks that Islam is such a weird and new and different idea. Still, if you study the way of Jesus, if you study the manner of Moses, if you learn the way of Abraham, if you go through the Bible and do your fundamental research, you will see that all they're doing is affirming the ways of old. People may say, you have stepped back in time, no. We have stepped back to worshipping God in the way he needs to be worshipped, we have stepped back to living a life in tune with the way he wants it to be lived. I mean, we don't want to ride along with camels and do away with technology and cell phones, we need these things. I have a car, and I have a cell phone I have all of these things that we need, that's part of this time. But when it comes to my direct relationship, with God, we have to go back to the way the prophets worshipped him, and that's a Muslim. Some may ask, what do you mean when you say in every show, worship the creator, not his creation, what do you mean when you say, worship the creator alone, what do you mean? Worshipping the creator alone comes from a word in Islam which means that you set your entire self to doing what God wants you to do, that is the essence of worshipping, deciding, Whatever God wants from me, I will do. And that is what Jesus Christ did his entire life, if you research his life, that whatever God wanted from him, he did, that is the essence of Muslim. And if God wants me to pray five times a day, that is what I'll do, and that is not even enough, that's the way the Muslims should feel, that's the way anyone who loves God should feel. There is not even enough that I can do for God to create me. If he wants me to fast, I will fast. If he wants me to abstain from drinking alcohol and refrain from sex without marriage, then I'll do that because that's the way of life that is pleasing to him. And that's the way we mean, we need you to make every step in your daily life following what God wants from you. So basically, you become a slave to God because you're a 
slave to somebody, you're a slave to your boss at work, you're a slave to that woman who's taking the money out of your pocket every day, or to the capital, so you're a slave to something. So, we're saying look, God is saying, be a slave to him. Yes, let him dictate your life, you call on him alone. He's the only one who can forgive your sins if you are under stress. You're not self-sufficient, you need a creator, and you need someone to turn to, so you turn to him alone, you pray only to him, you sacrifice only to him, you give charity in his name, not to the people in the congregation, you only do it only to him, you fast in his name, abstain from alcohol, drugs for him, you do it because he doesn't benefit from that, you benefit from it, correct. You don't lie, and you don't steal. You don't cheat. God is good, and he only accepts good, so by being a slave to him, that's when you become a perfect human, and so you just believe that you can get better and better, there are no limits to how good you can be, you don't know how good you can be you be as good as you want. To be and, that's how you get to the excellences of a human being, is by submitting yourself to the creator, living a life how he wants you to live, and this is the part I to bring to the people, by being a slave to God, worshipping him alone, doing everything that God wants you to do, and that's the same thing in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom comes, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and to, lead us not into temptation, and so on. The Jews and the Arabs who read the Bible in Arabic read Allah for God. Go pick up any Bible, go to any hotel, they have the different translations, you read the verse in Arabic, and you'll see the word Allah is right there. So, the term God in the English language, this word God didn't even exist never existed till 600 years ago. Okay, these are strong points, we've been showing all these things but every ye, very excited to talk to you about this, it's a vast topic. We're giving you the top 10 reasons why Jesus can't be God, but I wanted to stress what we're inviting you to, so we covered this. Let's go now to what makes us worship God we're the only creation he gave a free will to we accept that and then decide, we are going to provide that will back to God, for what, for paradise. What an exchange we get, we get something back that was given to us in the first place, and in exchange for that, we gain eternal paradise. That's the essence of worship, God gave you free will, ideally decide to give it back, I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what God wants me to do, which is what Jesus said, Muhammad said, Moses said, and therefore in exchange for that, I get eternal paradise. If you don't do what he wants us to do it is like you hit a dead end put the walkman on your ears, bobbing your head, drinking your life away, all being nice 30-40 years past, you get fat and earn some money then you die, and you didn't do what God told you to do. Then what think you enter paradise now? Let's talk about the number one reason the number one reason why Jesus, peace be upon him, is not God, cannot be God. The fundamental reason why Jesus cannot be God is that God is the essence of worship. God is the object of worship, God is the person who we worship, no matter what religion you follow, whoever they call God, he's the object of worship. It's who they give their devotion to, is who they make their prayers to, is who they make their sacrifices to, it's who they pay their charity in the name of God. So had Jesus been God, he would have told people to worship him, in Matthew 15 and 18, he did the exact opposite. He told people, in vain shall you worship me and teaching the commandments of men as doctrine. Not of me, not of God, you will teach as doctrine the commandments of men. That means you will teach as doctrine the commandments of the Trinity which come from men, you will teach as doctrines that I am God which will come from men, you will throw away the law of Moses and the law of God which will go from me, but the worship you will give to me will be in vain. And we all know the vain word means, it will not come to anything. We will go before God on the day of judgment, having worshipped Jesus 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and on the day of judgment, Jesus will deny those people. It is stated, in the Quran, on the day of judgment, when God will ask Jesus, did you command anyone to worship you, and Jesus will say, no, you know I will not do anything, except what? 
you told me to do, and all of these prayers and everything that has been made to Jesus is in vain because he does not hear these things. After all, he is not an object of worship. The devil has already said in the Quran that he will get people to worship him falsely, he will get people to worship idols falsely, he will get people to worship these things falsely, and then on the judgment day, he will leave you in the lurch. He will say I tricked you, and now am I'm free from you. I have nothing to do with you because I already got what I wanted you to do for so long, now, it means nothing. It will be just like dust, all your powers and praise and sacrifices you've made will be just like a blast of wind will come in and blow them into dust, they will be worth nothing. So, Jesus himself said, do not worship me, even when someone came to him and said, oh, good master, he said, why do you call me good master? There's nothing good but one, that's God when they came to call him master, he said, why do you call me master and you don't do my father's works? You know, he always denied that worship and anyone who ever tried to worship him would deny it. Some people may have called him Lord, saying that they respect, but no one should ever worship Jesus because of his title. Period. So it's evident and straightforward. Let's go back to the original Adam, the first man created by God, did he call upon Jesus, or did he worship God as a creator? Did he go ahead and do some of these things that people are doing? Adam directed his worship to God alone. Let's go back to doing what he did, let's go back and do what Abraham did. Did they call upon Jesus, did they call upon any other human being? If you look at the way we're supposed to follow the prophets, Adam worshipped God alone, Abraham worshipped God alone, Moses worshipped God alone, Noah worshipped God alone, David worshipped God, Jesus worshipped God alone, Jesus never called on Jesus, and lastly, the prophet Muhammad called on God alone. So, therefore, we should follow him and call on God alone.